In the current year of 2022, we're in a very strange era. This current generation has had a pretty weird childhood slash adolescence, being born in the aftermath of 9-11 and at the beginning of the Great Internet Awakening. And of course, in the past two years with the pandemic being a defining moment in most of our adolescences, it's been rough. We have never known a time in which it didn't seem like the world could end at any moment. The news is always spouting doom and gloom about something, but that beast that was awakened in our childhood, the internet, tempted us with its power. We saw all the weird shit that happened on there, the birth and the death of memes, the slow decline in the sanitized mainstream media style content, the takeover of a majority of the internet by tech dictators like Amazon and Facebook, and of course, Google. We live in a weird time, and the things that fascinate us, or at least a subsection of us, are suitably weird. In 2016, I got deep into vaporware, as I discussed in another video on this channel. And one thing that I found fascinating was the different aesthetics of different artists. Some used pictures of surreal, empty spaces that seemed like they should have had people in them. Some had a focus on old internet themes. Other artists, like the vaporwave adjacent Caretaker, who I found fascinating with his album and Deep Lift Beyond This World, that seemed to explore a world that felt like some kind of abandoned modern art gallery. All of these had a common theme, taking something abandoned and making it feel eerie and also new. Around the same time, I discovered another fascinating category of image, that being the cursed image. Cursed image is a strange kind of photo op. But in a unique factor in these images is how they manage to be unsettled. They aren't images of supernatural creatures, and they aren't images of horrible, gruesome deaths. They're just slightly off. It's a feeling that I can't put into words, and a feeling that no one really can. You know it when you see it, and that's also what led to their decline. This phenomenon was killed where all interesting things go to die, the front page of Reddit. Some people just didn't understand what made these images special, and eventually the idea of a cursed image became so distorted and oversaturated that now the term is meaningless. But the original images still have that uniquely surreal feeling. Another similarly unique internet phenomenon killed by Reddit, the creepypasta was something that many, including myself, adored throughout their childhoods. Sure, many of these stories weren't very scary or even good, but they had a charm to them. Stories about games messing up and being possessed would make the occasional real glitch feel horrifying. Stories about ghosts or monsters or killers, while not exactly original, still kept me up at night. I remember once thinking that the rake was going to be outside my window in the middle of the night. But what I found most fascinating were the stories about the internet or modern technology. Technology-based urban legends are the natural path for these stories, after all. Cursed websites that could kill you if you looked them up, mysterious phone numbers collected to equally mysterious groups, videos or photos that would manifest something awful. But one stood out, a sort of ritual creepypasta, the elevator game. The elevator game was less of a story and more of a tutorial about how to enter another dimension using an elevator in a hotel with ten floors. After putting in a specific code on the elevator, going to specific floors, you will eventually end up in the other world. A mysterious place that is exactly the same as our own, but with no people, and all the lights are off. Looking through the windows to the outside, the only thing you can see through the fog is a glowing red cross. If you get lost in this world, you may be trapped there forever. You might even wake up in a place that seems to be your home, but it may not actually be. This story works extremely well for me for some reason. The idea of a world exactly like our own, but with all these strange differences that you could be trapped in is so mysterious it draws you in. It leaves a lot up to the imagination, not explaining much of anything at all other than how to get to this other world. When a woman named Elisa Lamb had a manic episode and mysteriously died in a hotel called the Cecil Hotel, the mystery surrounding her death was conflated with her playing this game but it's unlikely she even knew what this game was. After that whole debacle, though, the story faded into obscurity. In 2019, a new story appeared on 4chan that felt very familiar. A story about another world that could be accessed by no clipping through the world in the wrong place. 
A world full of empty hallways and spaces that seemingly has no end. A world called the Backrooms. This term, no clipping, originated from 3D video games, and this idea of a fucked up empty version of a world existing if you clipped in the wrong areas has some history in games. Blue Hell, the Void from Pokemon, the Observation Rooms of Portal, the Far Lands from Minecraft, the Fourth Day Glitch from Majora's Mask. These are common occurrences in games, so a real world version, a place made up of seemingly abandoned dead architecture, without people, full of mysterious creatures, is something that it's easy for people to imagine. It's somewhere where you're not supposed to be. There's something about this image and other backrooms related images that just seems off. This backrooms idea caused an explosion of creativity around the original story and things it inspired by it, at least in part. This led to the emergence of the term liminal space into the mainstream internet lexicon. I've explained this in another video, but a liminal space is a place taken out of its designed context, essentially. It literally means a transitional space, but it's gained a new meaning on the internet. A school or a playground at night is the perfect example. These places are designed to have people in them, and are typically supposed to be visited at daytime. But without being used for these designed purposes, it feels eerie. A mysterious ghost out of place, out of time. You've been in a place like this before, walking to your hotel room after swimming in the pool, being at a gas station at 3 a.m., going to the beach at night and seeing at the abandoned pavilion, an empty mall when it's raining, the secret third floor of Macy's where they put the clearance furniture, a public park at night, the highway with no cars, moving out of your house. All of these are experiences that people in our modern age, and even in the past, have experienced at least once. A common theme with these experiences is that they often occur at night, and this makes sense. Our society is one focused around the sun and light, exploring the world when everyone is asleep, when the moon, the stars, and streetlights are the only source of light to be seen. Our world feels strange and off-kilter. This is the basis for liminal spaces. And these liminal spaces and this weird feeling is the basis for Weirdcore. Weirdcore is a new art movement, or as the internet refers to it, an aesthetic. But it's not exactly new. Essentially, Weirdcore is weird internet stuff. It has a specific vibe, though. Not everything weird on the internet is Weirdcore, but almost all Weirdcore originates from the internet. See, Weirdcore uses elements from everything I've talked about in this video so far. That strange liminal space feeling that sometimes is directly used in the art. They have the off-kilter, slightly creepy vibe of cursed images. And sometimes can go full into the weird early internet creepiness of old creepypasta. It's surprisingly popular and has been fascinating to me pretty much since it started. Weirdcore comes in many forms that are all pretty much the same thing, but with a different focus. Dreamcore is a form that focuses on the surreal, dreamlike feeling that some Weirdcore gives off, usually being a lot less creepy or off-kilter and going full into the tranquility. Traumacore is a form used by people who have suffered childhood trauma to cope and process their feelings about their experiences. And there are plenty of other forms that are just more hyper-specific forms of Weirdcore. The thing I find most interesting about this movement is how many different mediums it manifests itself in. Art, games, music, and even short films, it's an all-encompassing thing, and it's a lot to break down. The art, as in drawings and digital creations, is probably the most easily identifiable form of weirdcore. Drawings have a lot of weird, usually non-human characters. If they are human, there's something off about them. A lot of drawings are clearly inspired by surrealism and other modern art movements. The digital stuff is the most common form though, I'd say, typically being a collage style of work. Liminal spaces are cursed images with strange edits to them, adding human eyes to things that shouldn't have eyes, adding text saying something mysterious, adding filters to give images a stranger quality, adding black shadow figures or blobs as if to censor something out or using the iconic 2014 YouTube thumbnail red circle that typically points at nothing. 
the thing that I think is neat in general about Weird Core, but especially this form, is how low the barrier for entry is. Anyone could make this stuff, because everyone has had a weird experience before, at least a weird dream. Finding a liminal space that resonates with you and fucking around with it can produce some interesting results, and I find that fascinating. Not all art requires great talent or technical skill. Some can be interesting just from its uniqueness, and while sometimes even the drawings can seem a bit unoriginal or uninspired, it still shows an attempt at creativity. The people making this stuff are genuinely trying to make something they think is cool, and I think that's neat. Because in a lot of art spaces, people make things just to get popular, and while that exists here, it is far less common since the movement is relatively new. Obviously, with time, that'll dissipate and more frauds will come into the scene, if you're watching this video a year or two from now, this if this scene still exists by then, it's probably more common. But in 2022, it exists in a golden age where it hasn't yet been run into the ground. Weird core games are something I find fascinating as a bit of a video game enjoyer myself. Most weird core games were made before the aesthetic came to prominence, and even most of the ones made after took little to no influence from the aesthetic, but they still exemplify the aesthetic perfectly. Soup.9, for example, a game where you do nothing but walk around in these proto-weird core zones and look at wacky characters in the middle of a room. A game that was heavily inspired by LSD Dream Emulator, a game that creepypasta or gaming historians will likely be well aware of. A dream simulator where you go from place to place by running into walls. And when you're talking about dream simulators, you can't not talk about Yume Nikki and its slew of fan games being some of the most enjoyable late-night gaming experiences I've had. Ever. Omori, a game that I grew up waiting for, released two years ago, and the dream segments, especially in Black Space, are very weird core in nature. Hylix and its sequel, Hylix 2, are surreal masterpieces that I'll probably make a video on at some point. Roblox, as shitty of a game as it is, gives a lot of freedom to users to make their own weird core environments for people to explore with relative ease. All of these games are about exploring weird places with weird characters, and that's one of my favorite kinds of games. It's an aesthetic that's about the art and the fun, rather than the profit and attention. A lot of weird core puts people off, because, well, it's weird. But that's not a bad thing. Because if the general public is put off by it, the people who are into it are really into it. And a small, dedicated fan base is way better than a massive, disconnected fan base. Music is obviously something I have to talk about in this video. After all, if you're new here, uh, a lot of my videos are about weird and obscure music genres or just bizarre and disturbing albums. Music is something that plays a huge factor in weirdcore being an all-encompassing aesthetic, but the thing about weirdcore music is it's kind of hard to find and define because it doesn't really exist. A lot of weirdcore music is just OSTs from games that fit the aesthetic or pre-existing music recontextualizes weirdcore. Jack Stauber is a great example of this. He has been making weird, chilled-out lo-fi pop songs for years. His music has this particular vibe where it feels like you're watching commercials or PSAs at 3 a.m. on an old CRT, and it's a really neat feeling that fits pretty well with the aesthetic. A majority of weird core music is found in playlists on YouTube. And a thing I've realized about this is that a lot of the same songs are in these playlists. Still Life by Sitcom, Hey Kids by Molina, I'd Rather Sleep by Caro Carolina. I could go on, but I think you get the gist. This isn't a bad thing per se, it just feels like there could be so much more music classified in this genre that goes ignored by these same few songs. And if I want to listen to one of these playlists, I'll often skip these songs because I've heard them so many times that it's insane. There are a few artists who make music that fits this vibe, but what the ones that do are very good at it. The Graham Kartna is a very good example here, sounding like an odd blend of Lemon Demon, Ariel Pink, and video game music. His track Browser History is one you may be familiar with, gaining a huge amount of popularity after being used in a certain animation that we'll talk about in a little bit.
And speaking of music used in animations, Pilot Red Sun's album Achievement is an ambient fever dream that is just one of my favorite albums in general. Jerry Paper is an artist who is best known in the 2014 era Vaporwave, making music that, while all being originally composed, sounded like Ferraro-style Vaporwave with lyrics. This album, Chameleon World, isn't one that's mentioned a lot, or at all really, in the weird core part of the internet, but it's a perfect addition, I think. Of course, there's also Dream Corp, who is a dreamlike vaporwave artist making original compositions that really need more attention, being some of the most tranquil feeling new vaporwave that exists, and being a pretty commonly used album in weirdcore videos and playlists. Weirdcore is not a genre of music. Let me make that very clear. Right now, the music classified as weirdcore is all very stylistically different, only fitting a specific common feeling, which does not make a genre. That may change in the future, but as it stands, weirdcore music is not a genre, so don't come after me for making up a genre. I didn't. It's not a genre. It's an aesthetic. Weirdcore, for me, works best in animated form. It makes sense. Animation is one of the freest mediums of artistic expression. You aren't bound by real life's laws of physics, yet things can move. Hell, you aren't even bound by having to have things drawn. Stop motion and claymation can all be meshed together with traditional animation to make fascinating things. So obviously, weird core animations are great. Of course, with this term being relatively new, there are a lot of things that retroactively fit the term. Pilot Red Sun, as I mentioned before, uh, is a great example. His extremely surreal animation style is something that fascinates and inspires me. He makes these entertaining and surreal animations with some of the crudest drawings you'll ever see, and that's part of the aesthetic. Also, there are some of the funniest videos on the internet to me. To this day, I still regularly quote the Pringles advert video, and videos like Classroom Bully will never cease to make me laugh. I'm gonna take your candy. Not my sweets. Not my treats. Videos by the CGI animator Seinfeld Spitstain also carry the same feeling. These are absurd and surreal and low quality 3D animations that use that low quality to their advantage, giving the videos a more surreal, humorous, and sometimes even creepy feeling. His adaptation of the hit comic Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff is also incredible. I warned you about stairs, bro. I told you, Bob. It keeps happening. I told you, man. I told you about stairs. But one modern icon of weirdcore animation that has wormed its way into my heart is the animated series and soon to be video game by Joel G. Ina. The moment this thing showed up in my recommended, without even watching the video, just the Picasso-inspired character design, I knew this was something special. These videos are inspired by video games, internet aesthetics, old music videos, surrealism, but mostly they are completely original, and that's what's incredible about this. It's funny and interesting and visually stunning, and also there's nothing else truly like it. That's what the best weird core achieves, transcending its roots and becoming something entirely new. Truly, weird core doesn't mean anything. Trying to classify different things as weird core is practically impossible, because while this aesthetic is fascinating, it's sort of a you know it when you see it situation. And what what's weird core to me may not be for someone else. This is the nature of the internet though. They want to label everything. And sometimes things can't be labeled. And that's the thing about Weirdcore. A lot of it can't be labeled. 
It's stuff that can't be described with existing words or genre classifiers that we can only default to one made-up meaningless term to classify it. And that's the nature of the internet and aesthetics. So, as always, thank you for watching the video this far. Um, if you would like to uh, see more videos like this one, please subscribe, uh, or like it, or comment, even. Um, and if you want to support me more directly, I have a Patreon, um, and you can join this wonderful list of names. Casual Chris. That's everyone. Um, I also have a Discord server if you're interested in meeting people who have similar interests. Um, it's pretty cool. It's There's some interesting people in there, but it's a good time. Um, I'm sorry I have not uploaded a video in a, in a little while. It's been three weeks. Around three weeks. Um, I've been a little busy with school and stuff, and also I started a job. Um, but luckily, my school year is... Uh, is about to end um, and then I'll be on summer break and I'll be able to make more videos back to the regular schedule so I hope you guys can bear with me for for at least the coming weeks I'll probably have one video out um, it really depends but yeah that's that's what I got um, so yeah I'll see you in the next one whatever that one will be